Hello everyone, what's up? In this video I'm going to show you how to paint Warhammer tanks like this awesome Grim Tiger by Grim Prince using a late war German color scheme. I'll be giving it away on March 2nd, so make sure to watch until the end if you want to know how to participate in the giveaway. Here are some images of the STL courtesy of Brian at Grim Prince. What a beauty, isn't it? And moving on from STL to resin, this is the Grim Yak Tiger, or shall I say Yak Tiga, after priming. In order to create the perfect undercoat, I decided to reinforce the pre shading with some high contrast modeling using my trademark Scotch Bright trick. Using the pad as a stencil, I airbrushed this white primer at around 20 psi to create a random pattern. As you can see, I often gave it more than one pass per panel, until I was happy with the effect. Now, I had never used this technique prior to a German whole red top coat, so I was pretty excited to see to what extent it would show. In any case, I was really enjoying the way that this was transforming the look of the model so far. For some parts, like the cupola hatch, I decided to also spray a sort of diffuse highlight, in some cases in combination with the modeled paint. Next, I reinforce the shadows by spraying black primer on the outside of every panel and on panel lines. I knew from experience painting lots of clear red for my custodes army that this element of high contrast could be the key to having a really cool finish. So I took my time and I went around the tank in a methodical fashion. This was the fruit of my labors at the end of this important step. This is Tamiya LP18, dull red, which I thinned around 60% with Tamiya Lacquer Thinner. I started by applying what is known as a tack coat first, which is a very thin and transparent layer of paint. The result looked rather pink and weird at first, but I trusted the process and continued building up opacity gradually. This is a true lacquer paint, unlike those from the XF range, and as such, spraying it was a real pleasure no dry tip whatsoever, and perfect atomization all the time. After the first couple of layers of paint were done, it was time to reach opacity with more of a wet coat. The trick here, of course, was in making sure that I didn't lose all the work that I had put into the pre-shading before. I'm a big fan of World War II German Red Oxide Primer, or Oxidrot, and this was really beginning to look the part. When I was done, I inspected my work thoroughly and I was very happy with the results. Next, it was time to apply chipping fluid to the hull, having masked the casemate very carefully. As usual, I applied this transparent water-based liquid in a couple of coats, letting it dry for about 30 minutes. For the hull, I went with Dunkelgel Base by Ammo, which I sprayed at around 20 psi with my new HNS CR Plus which I was trying here for the very first time. Due to the smaller needle compared to my badger, I worked in smaller sections. When I was done, I really loved the finish, and I must say that the red primer undercoat really made a difference in terms of vibrance, even if the pre shading as such was no longer noticeable. I then picked Dungal Gelb Light Base and started applying some color modulation using a card as a mask. I finished with Dunkel Gelb Highlight applied only on some carefully chosen spots. Now I would have loved to show you more footage of the color modulation work, but regretfully most of the footage was out of focus. I'm a mere beginner at color modulation, but I was very pleased with this. What I do have a lot of experience with is chipping, and I was excited to see what it would look like with this color scheme. I wanted to make sure that the chips were small and pretty subtle, so I decided to try something new. Using a toothpick as my primary tool, rather than a flat brush with hard bristles. I went over edges, making small incisions in the paint with a tapping motion. I then went over those really fine chips, very gingerly with the brush, merely to enlarge them slightly. Notice that I'm applying very little pressure. I'm really not stabbing with the pick, 
as I would normally have done. But gently tapping along raised edges. Wait a second. Gently tapping? Where have I heard this phrase before? While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Anyways, after this small digression, and forgive me, but I am a literature teacher by trade, let us continue to look at those fenders. At this stage, I was really grinning from ear to ear as I did this. This was without a doubt the best, most subtle chipping that had ever done by a long shot. I didn't know what would happen later, but knowing this at least gave me great confidence in the final product. On this particular spot I decided to use the brush a bit more, but always with very little pressure and at a rather oblique angle. I should mention by the way that Amo acrylics are eminently more controllable than say Vallejo when it comes to using chipping fluid. In fact, I would say the difference is rather, well, huge, even though both are water-based. Now, this next step is without a doubt a mistake. So, do as I say, not as I did here. I applied some highlights to all the red panels, which ruined some of the shading and, most importantly, desaturated my reds far too much, even though I was careful to mix the red paint with light browns rather than white. Having said that, this did work well on the hatch and some other roof details, but I should never have done it on any vertical panels. So, moral of the story, don't mix color modulation with pre-shading, not on the same panels. Undeterred, however, I got my burnt umber liquid pigment out and got ready to reinforce the lost shading. I also had a plan to fix the desaturation of the reds applying a thinned down coat of Tamiya Clear Red. Clear Red, you say? Well, yes. Most people think that it can only be used for a glossy, glass-like finish. But it can also work wonders as a filter. As you can see, the effect was immediate and very noticeable, saving the day for me. This goes to show that it's important to face setbacks with a solution-focused approach. The next step was a pin wash on all the dark yellow areas, using ammos, Wash for Africa Core, which I diluted around 30% with enamel thinner. If you've seen any of my videos before, you will know that I always enjoy a good old enamel pin wash. But that was even more true of this model. This Grim Jack Tiger really lends itself well to this technique. For the casemate, I went with Ammo Dark Wash, which is also an enamel. But before I forget, I should mention two things that happened off camera prior to this. First, that I applied sponge chipping to the casemate using Vallejo Metallic Black, and second, that I applied a gloss varnish prior to any washes. If you want to know why I always varnish before I wash, why don't you check out my blog? To clean up the excess wash, I use a small flat brush slightly dampened with thinner. The aforementioned varnish made this child's play. And now for the step that I enjoyed the most by far and which was the most important for me. The tank markings. What you see me using here is a white weathering pencil by AK Interactive. These are in fact soft watercolor pencils and it was my very first time using them. The texture surface made it a bit hard to apply precisely because of how soft these pencils are. Their hardness level is not indicated but I'd say it's definitely 4B or softer. After retracing my letters and blowing the white dust away, it was time to go over the lettering using Washable White by Amo of MIG, which as the name indicates is a washable, water-based paint. This was all an experiment on my part, but the idea was that the combination of these two products would replicate hand painting markings made with chalk or whitewash while also allowing me to create the kind of streaks and paint runoff that would happen in the real world when those markings came into contact with stuff like rainwater. I'll explain why I chose this and what my sources are later on in the video. With that first marking done, it was time for the second one, which was really important for me and for the concept that I had in mind. Now, if you're a real fan of the Horace Harrison novels, you should really recognize that slogan. 
Getting those Roman numerals perfectly straight was an impossible task for me. I could have used a ruler or masking tape, but to be honest, it was part of the idea that the markings would have been applied by hand, using whatever the tank crew had at hand, so perfection wasn't really part of the concept. Having said that, I was so far from Fulgrim's vaunted perfection that I decided to redo the first Intera marking. But as you can see, no harm, no foul. Once all the markings were in place, it was time for the aforementioned streaks and paint runoff. To do this, I chose a very small flat brush, dampened with water, and I decided to use the flat of the brush, so to speak, and a very deliberate downwards dragging motion. It was the very first time that I tried this, but I was confident that this would bring me the results that I had imagined. My faith, or shall I say my faith in the Dark King, also known as Rex Tenebris, was rewarded with really cool streaking effects. The TRFT marking on the back of the casemate presented me with a much bigger canvas for streaking and I was really excited to see what I could achieve here. I'm not gonna lie guys, I said before that I was grinning like an idiot when doing the chipping and the same was true here. There is no feeling like trying something for the first time and getting it exactly how you had imagined it. Then I had the idea to retrace the letters with a pencil to see if I could get some stronger streaking. This worked brilliantly, creating some speckling in the process, which was a very happy, unexpected accident. To be honest, I liked the look of this so much that I decided to try the AK pencils for the rest of the streaking as well. Similarly, the Roman numeral marking was such a pleasure to do. Getting streaks as beautifully diffuse and well-shaped as those with oils or with enamels would be very difficult indeed, at least for me. The next step was to apply mud splatter using the speckling technique with a brush and a metal tool. I did this in two passes, with ammo loose ground first, and then with ammo dark mud, which is what you see me apply here. Now, I had some difficulties recording this, so I'm sorry for the lack of more detailed footage. In any case, I think the technique is clearly demonstrated here. Notice how fine most of these speckles or splatter is. This was nice and relaxing for me, but I did have to clean most of my bench afterwards. Next, I decided to try some of the other weathering pencils that I had just bought. Starting with this one named Chipping Color. I dabbed the tip slightly in water and I applied it around some rivets to see what the effect was. I really liked it, so I got my small flat brush out and I tried to create my first streak. As you can see, it started well, but then it became so thin that I erased it and started again. Second attempt now. Nah, a total failure from the start. Third try. Now yeah, this was looking promising, but ended up being far too subtle, so once again I wiped it clean and got ready to try again. Fourth attempt. Come on, you can do it! Now nah, let's erase it. Fifth try. <laughs> let's apply some more product and try again. This time I finally learned. The trick is not to come in from either side, but to drag the product vertically downwards in a straight line. Could it be? Would I get it right this time? Now that I had learned my lesson, the next few ones were a joint to apply. The rain marks on the casemate looked amazing and I really enjoyed that. So my conclusion on these weathering pencils is quite simple. They're freaking awesome. In fact, I really like the finish that you get with these, not just the application, and the fact that you can erase mistakes is a huge bonus. You're going to be seeing me use these a lot in the future. So guys, I did promise that I would be answering some of the most likely questions now. Why did I choose this seemingly weird color scheme? Quite simple. This is a color scheme which is traditional for late war German prototypes and for what is known as paper panzer or what if panzer. Tanks that could have been, but were never actually produced. It features parts left in the red factory primer, known as Oxidot, and others sprayed in German dark yellow or Dunkelgelb at the factory, sometimes in stripes, to save materials and time. As references, I use these two books, 
one by Ammo of Mig, and one by AK Interactive. Ironically, perhaps, I've always been fascinated by late war German contraptions and this beautiful hybrid of Warhammer conventions, like all the rivets, and the real thing presented the perfect opportunity for me. For the markings, I wanted to riff on the hybrid nature of the model itself, with a mixture of World War II and Horus Heresy references, among other things. So, as you can read in Paper Panzer, great book by the way, German prototypes always had hand-painted markings made by the engineers using either chalk or whitewash. Obviously, that was my first source of inspiration, and by extension, my first allusion. On the other side of the fence, as it were, actual Soviet tanks, not prototypes, were famous for displaying crude, hand-painted slogans, often of a provocative nature, let's say, with very few or none of the more professionally applied factory markings used by the Allies, for example. This is a style that I tried to replicate with mine, with streaks and paint runoff, as I said before, and that is my second illusion. The third illusion is one that should be familiar to any history buffs. Yes, that's right, Cobra King, but make it Terra instead of Bastogne. And speaking of Terra, this is meant to be a Horus Heresy model, of a traitor militia unit accompanying the Sons of Horus Legion, hence the 16th. And of course, TRFT stands for the Race for Terra. I always wanted to sign one of my tanks, so here is my signature. And last but not least, we have the Dark King. This is a chant which both the Neverborn and the Mortals dedicated to Horus Lupercal, aka the Dark King or Rex Tenebris. So, if you like the look of this tank, you should know that I'll be giving it away to one of my mid or top tier YouTube members on March 2nd. Or rather, I should say that they're going to compete for it in a live quiz where they will have to test their knowledge of my videos. A quiz, did you say? Well, yes indeed. It'll look something like this. Check it out. The winner gets the Yak Tiger, or shall I say, the Dark King. Anyways guys, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Before I let you go, I would like to thank all of my YouTube members, but in particular, Jan, who not only printed this beautiful beast for me, but built it, converted it, and applied that beautiful cast steel texture that you saw on the casemate. It's only fitting that I give it back to the community, I think. Now, I'll be back soon, but in the meantime, remember, keep it up and weather it out.